Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this morning's APSC CME webinar. My name is Jack from Singapore. Allow me to introduce this morning's uh, session on the Transcontinental Coronary Imaging and Physiology Club session. Today is a fellows course number two, focusing on coronary physiology. This event is organized by the APSC in conjunction with TCIP, endorsed by the Singapore Cadet Society in collaboration with our sponsors. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our chairs and co-moderators for today. We have Dr. Sydney Lowe from Australia, Dr. Paul Ong from Singapore, Dr. Christoph Jensen from Germany. Our speakers will include uh, Dr. An from South Korea. He's going to speak to the basics for coronary physiology measurement. Professor Morton Kern from USA is going to give an update on clinical conundrums of coronary physiology. Uh, Prof. Uh, Adrian Lowe from Singapore is going to speak to the limitations of FFR, IFR, or RFR. And are we ready to move on to CFR, IMR, and QFR? Quite a mouthful and a difficult lecture to give. Uh, Dr. Eric Chan from Hong Kong is going to speak to Beyond FFR, IFR. Dr. Lee Zhen Vin from Malaysia is then going to speak to post PC. I FFR, RFR measurements using case illustrations. Dr. Jonathan Sung is going to talk about FFR or IFR plus minus pullback IFR measurements. Some tips and tricks uh, from him to come. Our esteemed panelists include Dr. Chin Chi Yang from Singapore, Dr. Yong Cho Kim from South Korea, Dr. Lam Ho from Hong Kong, Dr. William Howe from Hong Kong, Dr. Siu Jian Chen from China. Some disclaimer this. Content is copyrighted by the APSC. The views and opinions expressed are those of the faculty members and do not necessarily represent those of the APSC. This webinar is currently made live stream via Wonder, APSC Facebook and YouTube pages. CME points will be submitted for those who are connected throughout the full duration. You will then receive your certificate of attendance after completing a survey. Click on the Q&A box below if you have any questions and our moderators will try to answer all of them. I'll now like to welcome Dr. Lam Ho to give the objectives of the TCIP club. Uh, Lam Ho, please. Oh, thank you, Jack. Uh, I'm Lam Ho from Hong Kong. I would like to introduce uh, the TCIP goods. Uh, the TCIP is a transcontinental coronary imaging and physiology club. This is a good uh, of people to, uh, with uh, all the renowned uh, experts, cardiologists all around the world. Uh, we have special interest on imaging and physiology. Uh, the aim of this group is to promote to share uh, the uh, imaging and physiology uh, to all the uh, junior and senior cardiologists. And also, uh, we may also discuss some uh, advanced and complex uh, case in uh, imaging and physiology. Uh, that's my. Uh, this is, is the simple and direct uh, objective of this cup under APSC. Thanks to Dr. Lam Ho from Hong Kong for curating uh, and gathering this group of like-minded folks. So let's get uh, started now. Welcome Dr. An to give the opening lecture on the basics for coronary physiology measurement. Dr. An, please. Dr. Can you Anna. see my slide? Yeah, we uh, yeah. can see and hear you clearly. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you, thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Jack Tam. So I'm Dr. An Jung Min from Asam Medical Center, South Korea. My topic is basic for coronary physiology measurement. So this is my patient to complain the typical chest pain, the substantial discomfort, the exertional chest pain. So what is next? The, I, I, I perform the coronary angiogram and Angiogram show that the very tight, looks tight stenosis at the uh, proximal RCA. What would it be next? Just the stenting. Angiographically more than 50% stenosis, uh, we call it the uh, significant stenosis. This idea came from the very old animal study uh, by the Dr. Gould. The diameter stenosis more than 50%, maximum coronary flow, blood flow is decreased more than 80% resting flow decreases. So after this study, the angiographically 
diameter stenosis more than 50% considered as a significant coronary stenosis. However, as you know, the coronary angiogram is very inaccurate according to the projection. Some projections show the very good, good lumen, but the other is very tight. So angiogram is not accurate. So traditionally, we try to detect objective ischemia. How to detect it during the stress? We have to we have to show the decreased quality of blood flow. How to? The change in the myocardial perfusion or contractility abnormality or electrical abnormality by treatment test, stress echo, or spec imaging. We call it the direct evidence of ischemia. This is the uh, test of the test to show the di direct evidence of ischemia. Why ischemia is important? No ischemia is very excellent prognosis. Very old data, no uh, perfusion defect in the thallium spec, the, the one year event rate is less than 1%. One per, one and treatment tested very, uh, very, uh, le very mild case of, of a, a very low risk of treatment test result, even, even though it is positive, ST depression is less than one millimeter or more than stage three positive, the medical treatment or surgical treatment in multivested disease population. This, this, this study was done in the almost 30 years ago. The medication is, was not good, even though no, no survival difference between the medical treatment and surgical treatment. So no ischemia is a very excellent prognosis. So ischemia test is very important. Even though in, in the context of ischemia trial, ischemia trial reverse radiation is not associated with uh, uh, the better survivor. So the, I believe that the noise ischemia is no stenting is still uh, still valid in after the ischemic trial. But uh, many patients who complained of uh, typical chest pain did not receive the uh, stress testing before the elective PCI. In addition, there was some limitation of non-invasive functional study. Look at angiogram is very complex but sometimes the thallium spec showed a normal because of velocity ischemia. In addition, this is another, another case, the treadmill test showed that the positive, stage four positive, but we performed the coronary angiogram with the mid RCA, intermediate stenosis, left main intermediate stenosis, which lesion would be culprit for the treadmill test positive. So the we need is ischemia test in the cath lab. So the, uh, so the Nicopas developed the fractional floor reserve. Fractional floor reserve is we measured uh, resting uh, under the hyperemic status. We measured the pressure ratio, distal uh, pressure pre, uh, pressure distal to the stenosis and outer pressure PD, P, uh, PAPD. This is a fractional floor reserve. Why we need the hyperemia resting status because of auto regulation. Blood flow is not linear to the chronic blood flow. Uh, chronic uh, coronary pressure is not linear to the coronary blood flow. After induction of hyperemia in the maximum pressure pressure dilation status, coronary blood flow is linear to the uh, coronary blood pressure is linear to the coronary blood flow. So when we measure the how decreased coronary blood flow, we can expect the how decreased coronary blood flow is. So this is FFR. FFR is 0.71. The blood, blood pressure decreased by 29%. It, mean, it, it means that the uh, chronic blood flow decreased by 29% compared with the uh, uh, normal coronary artery. So the almost 30 years ago, Nico Pals published this data, cut of value is 0 0.75, the FFI 0.75 against, uh, against the three non-invasive functional studies show that the very high sensitivity, specificity, positive and negative predictability. So the, we can call it FFR as a non-invasive functional study in the cath lab. Thereafter, the many studies show that consistently, uh, best cutoff value is located between the 0.75 and 0.80. So the, we call it the point, the great, uh, we call it the gradient between FFR between the 0 0.75 and 0.80. Initial cutoff value of 0.75, so different studies show that the FFR more than 0.75 should not be treated because long-term prognosis is very nice. But the FAM3 trial, FFR in cut of value increased up to 0.80 because the main intervention is to uh, uh, 
don't like to leave the looking stenosis, looking significant stenosis uh, untreated, uh, left untreated. So the BAM trial investigator increased the FFR cutoff value of 0.80. We, nowadays, we use the FFR cutoff value as 0.80. BAM2 trial showed that the less than 0.80, even in the stable angina, the PCI is associated with the better uh, uh, the reduction of ulterior vascularization. So the some some physicians uh, they don't have confidence about FFR cutoff value. So the recent we we validated uh, cutoff value. Initial cutoff value was validated against the non-invasive functional study. This cutoff value we we tried to uh, validate cutoff value against the clinical outcome data. So this is a red line. Red line means the different uh, red line is revascularized the lesion outcomes according to the FFR. Blue line is a different lesion outcomes according to the FFR value. These two curves intersected at the point of FFR 0.7, uh, 0 0.79. So very similar to the contemporary cutoff value FFR 0 0.80. Cardiac death MI cutoff value is 0 0.64, so lower than the death MI and repeat intervention cutoff value. Even though the uh, I, I believe that based on the, this, our registry data, we believe, I, I, I think that the contemporary cutoff value 0.80 is quite safe cutoff value to differ any kind of lesion characteristic and patient characteristics. Thereafter, we also evaluated the, the uh, clinical outcome between the uh, uh, between the PCI versus differed in the patient in the lesion with the gradient FFR. Gradient FFR is 0.75 and 0.80. Some patient differ, some patient perform the PCI. At four year follow <clears throat> in the gradient FFR, the different lesion performed the lesion no difference regarding the clinical outcomes that's uh, target vessel MI target vessel vascularization. So again, the FFR cutoff value 0.8 or the enough safe enough safe. So how to improve the FFR guided PCI? So the, it is our registered data before 2010. Not 10, we never used FFR. After 2010, we used FFR as much as we can, as many as we can, if there is no evidence of ischemia. After routine use of FFR, our patient critical outcome improved. The cardiac death MIT VR reduced by the 41%. This is real world registered data, very similar to couple of my curve with the, the FAME 1 trial. So what is the benefit of FFR? What is the benefit of FFR guided PCI is primarily due to the reduced number of stand per patient and subsequent to decrease the risk of periprocedural MI and repeat intervention. However, FFR requires hyperemia. Hyperemia, adenosine ATP on the grandil, sometimes contraindicated or dislikely by the patient at some time and cost and at inconvenience and the risk. So the 2011 concept of IFR firstly presented in the TCT. What is the idea of IFR? Uh, there will be just some, uh, the resting wave of fear period. What is the resting wave period? The, the, the resistance, the, the period of resistance is similar to the mean resistance during hyperemia. During the wave free period, when we measure the PDPA ratio, it would be very similar to the FFR. So uh, based on the ROC curve, <clears throat> they, they made the best cutoff value to IFR cutoff value to predict FFR 0.80. So the best, uh, best cutoff value to predict FFR 0.80 is IFR 0.89. So the, I think IFR is not a resting uh, uh, pressure ratio, but uh, the surrogate of FFR 0.80. So uh, 2017, the two important randomized trial published in the New England Journal of Medicine, they, uh, they claimed that the FFR is non inferior to the FFR to guide the revascularization decision. So the thereafter ES guideline endorsed the FFR and IFR both as a 1A indication to evaluate the hemodynamic relevance of intermediate stenosis. Thereafter, since the 2017, many non hyperemic pressure ratio has been introduced in our real world practice. Nowadays, we have at least 
five non-hyperemic pressure ratio so are the available in our cast plan. Resting PDFA, very old and traditional non-hyperemic pressure ratio, IFR, DPR, IFR for Kano, uh, DPR is common, RFR is about, DFR is Boston Scientific. So the, what is the uh, difference between the, the non-hyperemic pressure ratio based on the, our large registry, we evaluated that the correlation between indices uh, between the FFR and other indices, the accuracy rate is 80 to 85%, but between the non hyperemic pressure ratios, 79, 97% uh, of accuracy, the prediction of IFR less than 0.89, the AUC area, area under the curve is uh, the resting PDPA, DPR, RFR, and DFR, AUC is almost one. 0 0.97, 0 0.996, 0 0.996, 0 0.996. So I believe that the every non hyperemic pressure ratios are actually equal. So in addition to predict the clinical outcomes, so look at the couple of my curve. FFR is a little bit different, but the not other uh, non hyperemic pressure ratios, resting PDP, IFR, DPR, RFR, DFR, all looking same. So non hyperemic pressure ratio, Look at, I measure the resting PDP, uh, non hyperemic pressure ratio after simple cross of stunting for the JLG side branch. FFR is 0.83, resting PDP is 0.96, but RFR is 0.93, DFR is 0.93, IFR is 0.93, all the same. So, all non hyperemic pressure ratios are the same numerically, I think, identical. But sometimes there is the disc uh, discordant between the IFR and FFR. I measured the in, uh, proximal LAD intermediate stenosis. IFR is 0.95, but FFR is 0.79. The significant FFR, but the insignificant IFR. How much discordant between FFR and non hyperemic pressure ratios in our registry data show that 60% discordant. What makes such kind of discordant? We evaluated the predictor of the discordant region, the uh, resting PDP, low resting PDPA, but the high FFR means a very small hyperemic pressure throughout the low CFR phenotype. For example, the older age female and a non, non proximal. LAD location, but sometimes a high non hyperemic pressure ratio, but the very low FFR, very big hyperemic pressure drop, the supernormal CFR phenotype, for example, the young, yeah, younger patient and male, very tight stenosis. So we have to understand, we have to understand the, the, the clinical impact of this quadrant region. So first, the, what is the outcome of FFR and non hyperemic pressure ratio discordant? Uh, we don't have enough data about uh, this issue, but the small numbers of, of patient uh, data show that the cardiac death MR repeat intervention, there is no difference between the discordant region, high FFR, low IFR, low, low FFR, high FFR, no difference. But in our large register data, but we needed to publish this data, uh, there will be some discrepancy between uh, it in clinical outcomes uh, regarding the uh, low FFR, high PDPA, high FFR, low PDPA. So the, if the FFR is low, critical outcome is worse. But uh, we will publish this data soon. Another consideration is uh, the uh, intracoral or, or atherosclerotic burden between the IFR, FFR, I, uh, discordant region. The block, adverse plug characteristic is related more strongly with FFR than IFR. In addition, the focal disease is more frequently associated with the FFR positive but IFR negative region. Diffuse disease, non shootable for the uh, PCI, IFR positive region, FFR negative region is more frequently associated. So I believe that the FFR is uh, uh, more accurately predicted uh, over atherosclerotic burden. So how to compromise the, this kind of discordant? Traditionally, the physiology consideration, if IFR is very high or IFR is very low, the hyperemia is not necessary. But uh, between the uh, gray zone, the, between the IFR between the 0 0.86, 0 0.93, we need hyperemia to clarify the or rule out or rule in the clinic uh, functionally significant region. 
But I think it is the concept, atomic concept is more important because the left main proxy is uh, a proloscally more important area. Uh, there uh, is a frequently associated with the uh, IFR-FFR discordant. So for left main or proxy LAD, proxy complex region, I prefer the FFR measurement, but the uh, side branch distal region, small vessel, the uh, non happy pressure ratio is enough. This is my summary slide. Uh, current guide, I widely endorse the intracronary physiology FFR and IFR. IFR could be used in the revascularization decision making, particularly when hyperemic agents are not easily available. FFR would be preferred in the region which was approximately located or showed in geographically tight or complex. Non hyperemic pressure ratios are the same. Physicians can apply the other non hyperemic pressure ratios in daily practice in the same manner as IFR. Integrated approach using unhyperemic pressure ratio and FFR provides a more comprehensive physiology information of coronary artery disease. Whenever there is no evidence, we need intracoronary physiology for justifying our procedures. Thank you for your attention. Well, that was a fantastic uh, start, uh, Dr. Ang. Thank you very much for that wonderful talk. Um, so look, maybe I will ask uh, Dr. Lam Ho, can you, uh, do you have any questions for Dr. Ang regarding this wonderful starter and summary of physiology? Uh, I think uh, this is an excellent lecture. It solved uh, many of uh, the questions in my mind. Uh, we start to use IFL uh, uh, in the past year uh, recently. We found that there are many discordance between FFL and IFL. And then uh, we don't know how to interpret and how to deal with it. I think Dr. An's lecture gives us lots of insight on how to settle. And particularly, the, the important point is the use of FFL for the this proximal AD area. Uh, I think this is a very uh, important and uh, useful tips and tricks. What, what do you think? Uh, how about the others? So look, I think that your, your lecture nicely demonstrated that about 80 to 85% this concordance between hyperemic and non-hyperemic index. Now, if you are one of the operators, I know that operators are very busy in Asia, maybe only do the one index. There's no discordance if you only have one number, right? So then, uh, but I noticed that you've mentioned that if you left main LED, uh, you would prefer the FFR measurement. So you still consider that more go standard, yeah? You yes, I fully agree. Yeah. Yes, I fully agree with your your, 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 your comments. So the uh, still in my mind, the left main and proximal AD is. Uh, I have two uh, mind for the decision of revascularization. Actually, after the ischemic trial, I tried to more pay. I tried to to treat more patient by medical treatment. So, uh, it, but the. Uh, it also, the left main proximal LAD is still an uh, important location to improve the patient survival after the revascularization. So uh, regarding this kind of aspect, so I, 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 like to, uh, I, I like to rule in the left main and I try to evaluate the left main proximal LAD, try to do revascularization and non left main, non Proximal LAD disease. I try to evaluate why uh, not to not to put the stand and to treat medically. So in this kind of idea, I prefer the FFR measurement in the left main and proximal LAD, but the non left main and this the small vessel, I prefer the IFR. But I still I I'm I favor the FFR. Once I put the guide uh, pressure wire into the um, coronary artery, I try to the major FFR. Mm. Uh, Paul, you have a question? Yeah, um, thank you very much for a beautiful lecture. I, I just want to follow up on the left main LAD uh, FFR preference here. Now in Asia, and I think this is a fellow's course, in Asia, a lot of us do not use uh, systemic adenosine infusion to induce hyperemia. We tend to give intracoronary boluses uh, for that. So do you see that being a problem, uh, especially in the left main situation or proximal L, uh, left main situation, uh, the technical aspect of getting an accurate FFR here? 
Ah, uh, uh, great questions. The left main or LED, the most important thing is the guided, uh, guiding catheter disengagement, particularly the left main osteal region. Guiding catheter uh, engagement makes some inaccurate FFR measurement. So the, every time what you want to measure the FFR uh, for left main or proximal RCA, so you have to disengage the guiding catheter. In addition, so uh, many operators uh, use the intracoronary adenosine, but uh, in our centers, uh, we favor the intravenous adenosine infusion. So uh, for the more accurate evaluation, intravenous adenosine infusion would be better. In addition, in Korea, we can use a nicolandil instead of intracoronary uh, adenosine nicolandil. The uh, action time is uh, longer than adenosine itself, so the, the colandine would be better choice for the more accurate uh, accurate effect measurement uh, rather than the intracoronary adenosine infusion. So Dr. Ahn, I've got just two things. One is uh, uh, you've mentioned how accurate this is as a, a lesion-specific ischemia test. It's invasive, uh, addition to the angiogram, but you can tell that that lesion is uh, ischemic on an FFR measurement. And also you can do a pullback and check for diffuse pressure drop. One is the diffuse uh, gradient in a coronary artery. And second is about a post stent assessment, which people tend not to do for time and other reasons, which should optimize your PCI. So what's your current approach with these two things about a diffuse pullback gradient, even on the FFR and versus post PCI uh, assessment? Uh, regarding the uh, 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 thank you very much. Very, very important questions. Pressure wire pullback maneuver is very important, but uh, diffuse lesion, I, I didn't do. Uh, every time I, 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 I'm doing the pre pressure wire pullback to check the uh, pressure drift. So even though the, but particularly the, there is a tandem lesion, pressure wire pullback is more important to decide which lesion treat first. But the uh, uh, very simple diffuse lesion, I don't, uh, I don't, uh, uh, I don't decide my device relation solely depend on the FFR uh, pressure or pullback maneuver. The second case question is uh, the post PCI FFR or IFR measurement. There, there will be the another the lecture uh, after uh, in, in this session in this uh, meetings. But uh, I don't believe too much of a post PCI, uh, post PCI FFR measurement. I favor the uh, IVUS or OCT evaluation after the PCI because uh, uh, there is some lesion just uh, because uh, the, uh, yes, overall low FFR is worse than high FFR. But if you do the imaging guided PCI, even though FFR is low, we don't have we don't have more choice to do more. So basically, low FFR is associated with the underlying patient coronary artery disease status. Low FFR after PCI is not a modifiable factor. It is just a prognostic index, not a modifiable factor. So the I don't I didn't measure the routinely the post PCI FFR. So look, I think yeah, that's uh, fantastic. So you know, we're going to move on because I think that there will be some overlap. And I think the discussion will move on, yeah. probably repeat the questions again in a different way uh, after the talks. So I think we'll go to the second talk. So Jonathan Soong from Hong Kong was going to talk to us about, uh, once again, IFR, FFR. <laughs> Hello, um, uh, hello everyone. Um, thank you for having me in this um, conference. I really appreciate the invitation. Um, so it's a pleasure um, to speak to you all today about um, uh, a case uh, um, uh, with use of IFR pullback um, in coronary intervention. So to begin with, um, this is a 54 year old gentleman uh, with the background of uh, type two diabetes, obesity, who came to us with exertional angina. Um, he had a CT which showed moderate disease in LED and RCA, and there's 90% um, lesion in the PO branch that arises from the left circumflex. He has a normal um, LV systolic function with no regional abnormality. And here is um, the angio. 
On the, le- on the right side, um, there are some mild to moderate disease in the proximal RCA and also the, di- um, the distal part. And on the left side, um, pretty similar to what the, um, the CTV showed, um, there is a critical lesion in um, the distal AV group CERT. And in the LED, um, there's uh, some moderate disease in uh, proximal to mid, the mid um, LED, but which is rather diffuse. So here, what our plan is. Um, so in summary, we had a moderate LED disease, some critical left circumflex disease, and I think the RCA is pretty mild. So uh, the plan was to move forward with a PCI to the distal, uh, if you group search first, and then we'll do an IFR plus or minus PCI to the LED depends, uh, depending on what we find on IFR. And this is our case. So um, we did a quick uh, PCI of uh, the left circumflex. Um, it was pretty straightforward. Uh, we we'll put in a long two five stand and optimize it um, under uh, IVIS. And then we we'll move forward to um, work on the LED. So here um, we left the wire in the left circumflex in case uh, we need to send across um, the cert. And then we put a, an omni wire um, to do an IFR of the LED. So we parked it um, at the um, LED, uh, proximal LED left main with the sensor just uh, next to the tip of the guide. And then we take the introducer out. Um, we flush the entire system with saline. Uh, and then we normalize the system. And of course, we also get uh, intracoronary um, nitro. And here you can see we uh, normalize the system. And then we wire uh, the LED with um, the Omni wire here. The OmniWire is um, an improvement on its predecessor with um, easier, uh, better talkability. It's easier to use if you plan to do a PCI, but still um, I usually do it with, uh, wire it with uh, a torker. And then you can see um, rather to our surprise, uh, the IFR at distal LED turns out to be rather significant. Um, we took uh, three measurements as usual and um, measurement was around uh, 0.73 to 0.77, all of which are um, hugely significant here. And then we start doing pullback um, at a steady, slow, slow speed. And um, we make sure because we want to do a co-registration, so we need to have a um, continuous fluoroscopy throughout the, the pullback um, step. And then there is a much drift uh, after going back to the left main, we went back to one. And so uh, we came up with a distal IFR of 0.73 after the pullback. And now um, in order to do a registration, we need to obtain a good cleaning image. And uh, preferably we should do it at a higher uh, resolution, higher frame rate to get a better result. And this is um, uh, the co-registration uh, picture here. So each dot, each yellow dot here uh, represents 0.01 um, uh, change in the IFR. And so we, uh, we got a, just, uh, a pretty significant uh, distal IFR. And then the, the system would also give, uh, uh, depending on where we wanted to stand, the, uh, the system would give us an estimated IFR uh, after, for the post, uh, after the PCI. So if we decided to stand from here all the way to here, the system is telling us we should expect um, an IFR of 0.95 at the end of the case. And of course, if you plan to stand the entire length of LAD, then uh, usually you should get um, a uh, close to perfect IFR at the end. But of course, that's not always possible. So um, we move forward to do a PCI. We ballooned it, did an IVIS to estimate the, uh, the stent length, uh, the, the stent size. And also, we want to know uh, where we could uh, land.
And so we uh, put first stent, um, a 27538 in the proximal connect LED, and then a 3533 um, um, in the proximal, left main to proximal LED, and try to nail the uh, hostile left main here. And you see we're using um, the enhanced image um, uh, uh, here. So it's uh, so in the past we usually use um, stand boost to make sure the two stands are overlapping. But here the system actually has a function called the enhanced image. So if you turn your fluoroscopy um, to normal dose, um, it could actually give you a pretty good image that uh, to allow an adequate um, uh, overlapping of two stands uh, without the additional um, radiation from the stand boost. And so we repeated the IFR um, after stenting. So you remember we're uh, we're using the OmniWire here. So uh, in order to obtain um, an IFR, all we need to do is to plug that um, wire end back into the, the connector here. And then you can come up with an IFR value. And this is um, the IFR value after stenting. So the IFR grows from 0.73 all the way to 0.87 after stenting, but uh, obviously it's still not good enough. Uh, and so, um, we need some more stand optimization here. And uh, we do, did a post stand high pressure with enhanced image help. And then we repeated the IFAR here again. And the IFAR after um, post stand high pressure was 0.93. And um, of course, we're not we're still not satisfied because we uh, expected a, an I four point nine five um, before the procedure, and uh, and that's where imaging would help. So we did an IVIS here to see where we could uh, do better, and you can see um, it's a little underexpanded um, in the middle part. We could probably go higher up here. And so we did for the um, post and high pressure here. And make sure it looks fine on the IVIS. And you can see we actually nail the osteum, uh, the stand expansion looked better. And then we repeated the IFR here again after IVIS guided uh, stand optimization. And the IFR turns out to be 0.95, which is. Um, where we expected it to be at the beginning of the procedure. So this is the final angiogram. Uh, the stands in the LED and the left circumflex look fine. We're happy with the result. So just a summary of um, our I4 measurements here. So at the beginning of the, the case, um, the distal I4 was 0.73. Uh, and then the um, after deciding the landing, um, we expected a, a post-procedure IFR to be 0.95. And after stenting, um, the IFR was up to 0.87. Um, and then with initial optimization with non-compliant balloons, uh, it went up to 0.93, showing how important uh, it is to do post and high pressures. And then with the additional uh, information from IVIS, uh, the IFR went up to 0.95 which is where we expected it to be at the beginning of the case. So IFRC registration is a huge step forward from uh, the previous um, uh, technique uh, by mapping the IFRC values to the correct location on the angiogram. And uh, it gives you a better picture of where you want to intervene. Uh, there are some little tips and tricks here. So, of, um, when you do your pull back, you need to be steady and slow at a, uh, a rate of approximately two millimeters per second. And then you need to make sure you don't um, don't take off fluoro during your pull back, otherwise it doesn't work. Uh, it's better to have a frame rate of 15 frames per second in order to get a better image quality and uh, uh, therefore more um, 
uh, accurate result. And then uh, another important thing is you need to keep the table, the zoom, and the CRM angle static prior to it and also during the pullback. If you change any of these, uh, the registration will not work. And of course, uh, you need to ensure a good cleaning quality. So in conclusion, I think um, RFL pullback with co-registration now, it's moved um, to corner physiology from just as justifying the procedure to now being able to guide every step of your current intervention. Um, at least the RFL pullback with co-registration will give you a good idea of where you want to land your stands and also where, where you expected uh, uh, your post IFR to be and, and just try to work towards that uh, target. And um, in our case, we use OmniWire throughout the um, P, uh, LED PCI and it made uh, IFR guided sound optimization possible and actually easier because all you need to do is just plug it back into the connector and then uh, take measurements. You don't really need to rewire it. But of course, there's one important potential pitfall is uh, because the longer you, you dwell your, your wire inside the coronary, the, the more likely that you be getting drift. And because we did not pull back the wire, we never know how much drift we have here. So alternatively, if you want to do um, uh, I for uh, in each step, uh, you could just um, use the uh, usual workhorse wire for the PCI, and then you just uh, send your only wire down um, whenever you want to do an IFR. But of course, uh, it's it's not always easy, especially before you optimize your stand. You probably would find it difficult to uh, send a wire down. And and of course, and at the end, I think um, although I'm a firm believer in uh, coronary physiology, I think um, it does not replace uh, imaging. Uh, Intracoronary imaging is still essential um, in uh, every PCI case here. So. Um, Here's the end of my presentation, and I would love to hear what you think about um, this physiology uh, technique. Thank you very much. That's a wonderful, wonderful uh, case demonstration of uh, complementary technologies of the intracurrent imaging and the uh, pre uh, pressure wire pullback. So, Dr. Le uh, Dr. Chin, you have a um, question. Yeah. Yes, yes, uh, that's a great case, uh, Jonathan. Uh, I think you illustrated very well how uh, physiology and um, imaging can be used together uh, synergistically. I just have one comment and uh, one question uh, for you. Um, the, the comment is, re is relating to how to optimize our use of uh, sync vision and the co-registration. I think you gave some tips. I, I would just add one tip um, there, which is uh, when you're taking the, uh, the, the, the CINE uh, to try and make sure that there's a, as little overlap as possible um, between your target vessel um, and, uh, and, and other uh, irrelevant vessels. Because if there's any criticism about your wonderful case, it's just, uh, I, I would say that the pre-PCI pullback, your IFR pullback, there was a little bit of a overlap with the CERC. So I think the, uh, the, the software got confused and drew a, drew a track along the CERC instead of um, uh, on the LED. Uh, but that's, that, that's a minor point. I just wanted to ask um, with regards to um, your final um, or, or post-PCI IFR assessment, whether you um, uh, consider uh, an IFR pullback at the end to try and see if there was a step up um, anywhere along the stent, perhaps that might indicate that that area of the stent uh, was underexpanded or, or, or at the edges. Because um, uh, I think um, you did a, a, a final IFR, but I'm not sure if you did a final IFR pullback. Um, yes, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chin. I, I think uh, the first point is very important. Um, ideally, um, to get a better um, uh, uh, image and more accurate result, we should uh, avoid um, overlapping of the vessels, which is a very important point. And um, secondly, um, uh, we, uh, we, we only did, uh, we, we did the final pullback um, uh, uh, primarily to, to illustrate there, there was no drift in our case, which there wasn't much. Um, but we, uh, we, uh, the, the final IFR was 0.95, and it actually uh, all of that came from the um, stented area, because um, at the beginning of the case there is some uh, distal LED segment that we decided not to stand, and that's why we um, expected the final IFR to be 0.95. But um, luckily, in our case, throughout the stented part, uh, there actually wasn't any um, IFR um, change. Uh, all of that uh, 0.05 came from the unstented distal LED. But um, yes, I think uh, there are some ongoing trials and uh, which try to ut utilize IFR pullback to, to see where like um, 
uh, uh, there's residual IFR change to try to um, uh, guide the, the post-end optimization. But fortunately in our case, um, there wasn't much and um, the IFS IF, uh, IF actually did all the work for us. Great. So Christoph, maybe a quick comment because I think we are running out of time a little bit. Thanks. Sure. Uh, thank you, Dr. Song, for this uh, great case and uh, the nice demonstration of the IFR pullback. Um, from the, I got two minor uh, things. Um, are I'm I'm interested in what your take on it is. Um, I I noticed you you used uh, a second wire, um, and it was clearly for stabilization of the the the, the catheter. But sometimes, if you um, it's easier um, to do a workhorse wire first to the distal uh, vessel that you want to uh, assess, and then put the, the IFR uh, wire down. Um, what is your what is your intake in there? Um, do you think there is any um, like uh, impact on the on the measurements that you uh, do um, when you have a second wire? And the second thing is. Um, uh, what about contest agent? Um, sometimes you do an arresting IFR and then I, I give some contest agent just to, to have some hyperamia in a, in a kind of, uh, it's a poor man's uh, adenosine. And uh, then I see these uh, values change. Um, do you have any, any, any feeling or data for, for it if uh, this is a valid assessment of, uh, of um, uh, physiology? Dr. Jason, thank you very much for the questions. Um, so uh, on the first point, um, uh, uh, we left wire in the left circumflex because we uh, we did the PCI to the left circumflex first. And then because we uh, we think there's a high likelihood we need to stand all the way into the uh, also uh, left main. So we just left the wire in the left circumflex uh, to protect the left main uh, as a provisional, uh, provisional strategy. Um, but if, as in some as in some cases, if you want to use a second wire for um, stabilizing the guide, I think it's fine as long as you normalize um, with the second wire in. Like if it, all your con just because I think the principle is you have that the condition before you normalize is the same as when you take your measurement. So some people would want to keep the introducer there. Uh, it's still fine for some people. Um, uh, as long as you just uh, not do normalization with the introducer in or with the second wire in. Although um, some would argue it's uh, less accurate, but I personally find it, uh, it's, it's totally fine with the second wire, as long as you normalize with the second wire in. And, um, uh, and on your second question, um, sorry, which remind me um, about the second one. Uh, the contrast agent, if, uh, you're, yeah. if you're arresting, uh, testing, and then, then yeah. give some contrast agent to see how the values change. Yeah, so um, I, uh, I think in the classical teaching, we um, before we take the IFR measurement, you should try to clear the system of any contrast um, agent. And um, because I, I routinely give um, a nitro before um, each IFR measurement. So uh, I, I don't really rely on contrast in, in doing that job. And I noticed uh, uh, if you do not clear the system of all the contrast, there, uh, the IFR uh, value is actually not as accurate. So um, by teaching, I, I always clear the system of any contrast with just saline. So to make sure that it's all saline in between to, uh, for a more accurate uh, IFR measurement. Um, because we have, I think nitro is so handy. I usually just use nitro for um, uh, the facial dilatation, and then I, I don't really use contrast there for that purpose. Thank you, Dr. Sun. Thanks. Um, yeah, so I think it's up to you, Chris. Yeah. Christoph, yeah, it's up to you now. <laughs> you can moderate. Uh, great, thanks. Um, yeah, in the interest of time, I think we have to move on. Unfortunately, um, Professor Kern is not. Uh, present here, but he recorded a, a, a nice case and a live case uh, for us and this uh, lecture. Um, so maybe we can um, play it. Hello, this is Mort Kurt, and I'm sorry I can't join you live, but I'm going to provide you uh, with an update on clinical conundrums in corneal physiology. It's a pleasure to be able to talk to the APSC. 
uh, this evening. These are my disclosures. I do speak for companies that make physiologic measuring equipment. Well, let's just start in. I picked five of the most common corny conundrums in physiology that we're going to have to deal with. And I've listed them here as scenarios and the main issue at hand. And then at the end, after we discuss each one, I want to provide some solutions and some commentary for you. So let's just start in. Scenario number one, your NHPR is 0.87 and your FFR is 0.86. What does this mean to you for clinical judgments? That is, you've chosen to do two measurements, a resting ratio and a hyperemic ratio, and they're discordant. How do you determine who you should trust? We're gonna cover that in just a minute. How about the scenario where you have a left main intermediate lesion, 50%, and downstream LED disease? Is the left main assessment with FFR suitable in the circumflex artery? Is it accurate in that location? This points to serial lesions, that is the left main and LED lesion in series may provide a, a different answer uh, than if the LED was not in series with the left main. Conundrum number three, non-infarct related artery FFR is 0.85 in my STEMI patient. Can I trust this value? Is there a reason why the non-infarct FFR may not be accurate? And this addresses the issue of the acute coronary syndrome where uh, the dynamic nature of myocardial beds and myocardial lesions uh, gives us pause in using physiology now because it may change over the recovery period. Conundrum number four is the post-stent FFR is 0.84 in a diffusely diseased segment. Does this mean that we're done with our stenting? And of course, a single point FFR in a vessel uh, may not represent the entire burden of disease or the residual lesions which may be present and cause a problem. We're gonna see that again in just a moment as well. And the last conundrum of, of the many that we could talk about Conundrum number five is that I have a TAVR that's planned in my patient. He has a 50% LED lesion. Is my NHPR or FFR accurate in this setting? And will it change after I do TAVR? And this has to do with the issue of aortic stenosis coronary flow responses after valve replacement. So let's just dive right into each conundrum. I wanted to remind you that if you're an operator that doesn't like to use adenosine, you have options. And listed here are all of our hyperemic and non hyperemic pressure ratios. The hyperemic pressure ratio is in purple, contrast FFR and adenosine FFR. And then we have our non hyperemic ratios, the full cycle PDPA, RFR, and then the diastolic subcycles as listed. And of course, no hyperemia with adenosine means you could use contrast FFR or nitroprusside FFR, or you could use one of our many non hyperemic pressure ratios. So conundrum number one, uh, actually I've broken into two parts, is in this uh, severe linear coronary artery, we measured an NHPR of 0.94, but an FFR of 0.80. What is responsible for the visual functional mismatch? And there are a lot of answers to this question, but moreover, uh, the, the corollary with this is why do we have such a big spread in our non hyperemic pressure ratio of big discordance at 0.94 versus 0.80? So let's talk about that for a minute. So first, the visual functional mismatch is uh, mostly a component of two things. One, the two-dimensional angiographic image doesn't portend all of the information we need to talk about coronary resistance. And two, the myocardial bed is um, problematic. And that if you have a very uh, diseased or scarred bed, you may not get a uh, very good response to flow. And thus you could have a high uh, NHPR. And perhaps if you had a great increase in flow for, for uh, coronary flow reserve, you'd have a low FFR. So let's look. The major items we talk about when, when we encounter discordant physiology are first, the discordance occurs mostly around the cut points. Those values closest to the thresholds often are discordant one way or the other. There is a good understanding of discordance due to changes in flow. That is, high coronary flow reserve produces large discordance between resting and hyperemic values. 
And then finally, you must check for errors to make sure that this discordance is not due to some technical error. Did you measure too soon after flushing with contrast? Uh, is your pressure damped? Uh, are your signals correctly matched and zeroed? Now, I do want to emphasize that you know you obviously chose to do a second measurement. If you chose to start with NHPR and then went to FFR, that means you didn't trust the NHPR and vice versa. If you start with FFR and choose another ratio, that means you didn't trust the FFR. So who do you trust? My recommendation here is pick one that you like. If you don't have trust in it for some reason, move on to the next, but otherwise use one or none. Okay, the impact of coronary flow does uh, produce discordance between resting and hyperemic ratios. That is, in patients who have uh, a high IFR, such as shown in the green curve, you can increase your disparity to have a negative, or sorry, a positive FFR to a value of 0.73 if you increase your flow three times, threefold. So you move up that mild or non-ischemic curve to produce an ischemic FFR value. And you can always have an FFR uh, value that's abnormal with the IFR normal. That's concordant abnormalities. And those patients have the uh, poorest long-term prognosis compared to these patients who have disparity between the NHPR and the FFR. They have relatively good long-term prognosis, you can treat either one, either defer or treat, and those that have concordant normal physiology do the very best. Another reason why discordance may occur would be that there is a predominance of either diffuse disease or focal disease, and each type or morphology of disease produces a preponderance of disparity leaning toward FFR or leaning toward IFR. So if we look at the the signal on the right, we see an abrupt step up in a focal stenosis. It has a large coefficient of separation and it is associated more often with a focal lesion, positive FFR and negative IFR, such as the case we saw in the example just a moment ago. On the left, you see the, the pullback curve of a diffusely diseased vessel. There's a, a long segment with a large coefficient of friction. And this type of lesion favors the positive IFR, but negative FFR. So you're gonna see these mixed disease patterns uh, when we do our pullback discussion in just a moment. But uh, for understanding disparity, lesion morphology does impact it as does flow. So here's a, a collection of uh, scenarios of uh, different types of anatomy that produce uh, favorable responses for hyperemic or non-hyperemic ratios, one over the other. And if you just look from the top down, multi-vessel disease, you can use either one. Left main coronary disease at this time favors hyperemic. Focal LED, uh, either one. Diffuse disease, non-hyperemic pressure ratio, acute coronary syndrome, neither one, except in the non-target vessel. Diabetes, either one. Post side branch interrogation has data from hyperemic uh, studies and post PCI assessment again has more studies for hyperemic uh, FFR. But I think the resting hyperemic ratios, resting non hyperemic ratios have great value and are used frequently. Conundrum number two you have a 50% left main and a 60% downstream LED disease. Can I trust the FFR in my circumflex? The answer is yes. In the case where the left anterior descending lesion is not greater than, uh, is not less than 0.60. And uh, what you see here illustrated on the top is a, a serial lesion between left main and LAD. The net left main LAD FFR is 0.60. We measured FFR in the circumflex, which is the same as the number between the two locations, which you know in serial lesions has a problem. And after the LED was stented, the flow to the anterior wall increased, the myocardial bed size was then uh, relatively increased and flow increased, again, causing FFR to drop across the left main as measured in the circumflex. Well, let's take a look at the experiment that proved this to be true. 
Bill Furon and colleagues did this uh, several years ago. What they did was have an LED lesion. They put a stent in it. They left the balloon in it over a pressure wire. Then they put in a balloon in the left main, another balloon in the left main, and a pressure, another pressure wire in the circumflex. And they created an intermediate left main stenosis with the balloon and an intermediate uh, stenosis with that in the uh, LED. And what you can see is that as they inflated the LED balloon, that's the top arrow showing the yellow FFR line during LED inflation. And in the midpoint where the white arrow appears, you can see the yellow line, the FFR line drop as the gradient gets worse. Simultaneous with this, you can see that in the circumflex, that's the lower tracing, the circumflex FFR representing the left main lesion, as the, as the uh, FFR gets worse in the LED, as the gradient is worse in the, uh, in the uh, bed, anterior bed, then blood is reduced overall and the FFR goes up in the apparent circumflex as you reduce global flow across the left main. So this validates the theory. And fortunately, only when the left main LED FFR was less than 0.6 did it impact the apparent FFR of the left main measured in the circumflex. In that case, you would use IVUS. So here's a summary of that. When is FFR not reliable in the left main? Well, across either osteal, mid, or distal branches, it's fine. There's no problem. You can place the transducer uh, in either LED or circumflex, and you would do both for combined distal lesion. If you have downstream disease, as we just spoke about, you can measure the summed LED FFR. And if less than 0.6, you're going to need to use IVUS because the circumflex won't be accurate. And then finally, uh, make sure you don't put the pressure wire between two lesions because you won't get a right answer and you could possibly have a false negative. The distal lesion does block maximal hyperemia. And under number four, this is a patient with a STEMI who has a non-infarct uh, non related artery FFR of 0.85. And the question you ask, can this be trusted? Well, is the non-infarct related artery too close to the STEMI zone? In that case, you'd have to wonder. Uh, no, there are no such things as false positives. That is, if your FFR is abnormal, it's truly abnormal. You can't make it go down uh, by anything other than a technical failure. And finally, your confidence is highest the further you are away from the STEMI zone. Now, just to remind you, we don't use culprit vessel FFR because the Acute coronary syndrome produces a dynamic myocardial bed response and a lesion response that is also dynamic over time. For example, FFR of 0.84 across a 75% stenosis in an acute infarction with half the myocardium having scar can change over the next few days and drop to 0.50, same lesion, with a recovered myocardial bed that is twice the size. So the myocardial bed size impacts our FFR serial lesions and it impacts our lesions in acute coronary syndromes. Now, most recently in this paper from Trolls, uh, it was a beautiful example of what happens in the acute setting, the subacute setting and the recovered setting, stable setting to coronary flow reserve, FFR and IFR. And this is, this is talking about that change in the, uh, basically the non-infarct related artery zone. So in the acute zone, uh, if you start with a low CFR, a borderline FFR and a borderline IFR, in the subacute setting, there'll be little change in the physiologic indices, but some improvement in coronary flow reserve. And in the recovered stable setting after weeks, coronary flow reserve could increase markedly. There may be a small decrease in FFR and a small increase in IFR. I think that it, at a distance from the acute syndrome, both FFR and IFR are trustworthy, and you can use them to assess the non-infarct-related arteries. Remember, a positive uh, infarct-related artery is positive for ischemia, regardless. Okay, conundrum number four. 
My post-stent FFR is 0.84. I have a disease vessel segment. Is this really a problem for me? Do I understand everything I need to know about the post-PCI physiology and stent? Remember, the stent is implanted well and verif verified with IVUS. The physiology depends on where you are. A single FFR at one point in the vessel is not enough. If we want to understand what the anatomy and physiology of that vessel is, we have to use a pressure pullback over a distance. And with this, we can compute a pressure pullback gradient. It's a little complicated on this particular calculation, but the concept is simple. As you pull back across the lesion, when you see a great step up, you calculate the, the gradient units per distance and you get an index. The higher the number, the more focal the lesion. The lower the number, the more diffuse the lesion. And of course, if you have a mixed vessel, you're gonna have a mixed PPG index value. This is going to be very helpful so that we can say, yes, we have lots of disease without a single focal area, or we have minimal disease with only a single area. And the PPG index and pullback, especially if we co-register that on IFR, will be particularly helpful to know when we're finished with our stenting. Okay, conundrum number five, our last one for this brief session. We have um, a TAVR that's planned. There's 50% LAD, and we want to know, can I use NHPR or FFR? Because after I put in my TAVR, I don't want to have to go back again. So briefly, the remodeled Myocardium in the aortic stenosis patient produces an impairment of coronary flow reserve, a higher than expected FFR, but doesn't really impact the IFR. After the valve is placed, the muscle remodels, coronary flow reserve goes up, fractional flow reserve can go down, not by much, but it goes down, but IFR is not affected very much. Now, Cush told us that coronary flow and IFR, FFR before and after TAVR improves. I think that's rather remarkable. That is a coronary flow, PDPA goes up, IFR goes up, FFR flow goes up, but the FFR calculation value gets worse, more severe, and IFR doesn't change much. So although these changes are of small magnitude, they're important to consider, and IFR seems to have more stability and less impact after TAVR. I'm going to skip this slide. Just to let you know, there are many ongoing physiologic studies about guiding, using physiology guiding revascularization in the TAVR patients. And listed here are six studies that are going to be available to us shortly. So in conclusion, I want to say we've gone through these conundrums in coronary physiology. Well, let's just take a quick look. So for the discordant uh, NHPR versus FFR, I think a stepwise approach is needed. Your level of clinical confidence is important. You have to be a, a clinician to employ and separate out which you want to follow. And of course, is are you in a, a patient who has ACS, microvascular disease, and are you free of technical error? For serial lesions, especially those of the left main, we talked about when you can use IVUS and when you must, or when you can continue to use your physiology to assess this. Both FFR and NHPR have been used to define whether a left main lesion will benefit or not benefit from medical therapy or surgery after assessment. For the acute coronary syndrome, your confidence in the non-infarct vessel is highest when you're away from the STEMI zone. Uh, and uh, recall that there are no false positives if that is free of technical error. Single point FFR can under number four. Again, we should be using pullbacks, co-registered to understand completely whether we have diffuse, focal, or combined disease. The outcome of those will, are pending, but likely I think will be positive. And again, after TAVR valves, coronary flow tends to increase. The change in magnitude of FFR is a little greater than the change that you might see with NHPR. And I think you can use those at the moment, although there are many studies with outcomes pending. I want to thank you for your kind attention and look forward to hearing from, from you in the future. Thank you.
Well, what, what an excellent overview and uh, a nice presentation. Uh, unfortunately, he is not here um, to ask our question to, to Professor Kern, but uh, I think he raised very, very important points. Um, for me, um, like one very important sentence is uh, use one or none. Uh, so it, it makes easier um, the, um, your, your clinical task if you're rely on your favorite uh, 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 non-ischemic uh, 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 PDPA or IFR and then go to, uh, to FFR instead of going through every single uh, 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 measurement that you can can use. It definitely helps. Um, and the uh, serial testing, uh, it gets complex if you have serial lesions and LID and and circ uh, and you measure every every vessel there is. Um, for me, I always try to make it as simple as possible and and go for one vessel and then do the other. Um, maybe um, Dr. Howe, um, I mean there were so many points um, uh, risen in, in in this talk. Um, Maybe what is what is your uh, uh, what is your take on on serial uh, um, uh, uh, stenosis in in your patient? How how do you approach them? Okay, Kato, Before I answer your question, I want to ask the panel because we know that this call does, does happens. So if when is the time we decide which one to trust? Because the problem is that if we don't do both, we don't know there's a discussion, right? So let's say we do an IFR, it's a negative or it's a positive. Should we proceed to go for FFR to double check? So anybody can give me a comment on this, you know, because now we know 20% okay, of the cases we got discarded. So when's the time you say, okay, IFR is enough or FFR is enough? So the question is what Dr. Arn's a uh, bit of a lecture, he gave you a sneak peek at his unpublished data is about the outcomes if you were deferring. So 80% they agree. So even if you do two indices and the, of the group that's 20% or 15, 20%, which are discordant, the one you worry about is potentially the one with worst prognosis mm -hmm. if you left defer them, which is what he suggested is FFR po uh, positive and I, uh, non NHPR negative. And he's got some data, although quite small in registry follow-up. The question is, if you believe that, then uh, this is the group that you're worried about, which means that you cannot escape from not doing a FFR uh, uh, in most of your patients if you worry about them. And, then, and hence he recommended the people you worry about most is the left main LED and everything else you might want to treat medically in light of ischemia trials. So um, I don't know what you're doing, but um, uh, I'm in a research institution. So a question why it comes out, I'm doing everything. So I am a CFR, <laughs> everything gets reported, RRR. R, 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 so because I have a database of it uh, in my patients and I follow them up, but that's not usual practice. In clinical practice, I would recommend do one, believe it. Uh, if you want to do FFR in your early life, man, great, but uh, try to avoid confusing yourself. Okay. We also hear Adrian's uh, thoughts because he is expert on this area. Yeah, uh, like uh, Sydney, I actually also uh, do quite a uh, a uh, host of uh, investigations. And uh, personally, I, I still to, uh, rely on FFR and uh, I'll, I'll probably to clarify that later in my, in my short talk. Yeah. Okay. Then we proceed for... Yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll just add my two cents worth uh, about, about this topic. I think um, before I do any invasive uh, physiology, I think just looking at the angio, I get a feeling about whether or not um, I think it's, uh, it's going to be significant or whether I think this lesion needs to be treated, um, whether it's easy to be treated. And then um, usually I'll start with the non-hyperemic index IFR. And if the IFR agrees with what I thought, um, whether it's positive or negative, then most times I probably just stop there. But if I really don't want to do the PCI, for example, but IFR is, is positive, you know, uh, then maybe I'll, I'll, I'll do, the, do the FFR just to see if there's, there's any other reason, I guess, to, 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 you know, to try and uh, 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 sway me towards what I thought uh, uh, before doing the physiology uh, would have been the right choice. Um, but that's, that's just my, my personal practice. Mm. One thing that I... Um... 
what I like about the different types of um, of uh, resting indexes is um, we we are using now PDPA uh, quite a lot. So and the the good thing is you you got your workhorse wired down and then use the microcatheter um, to do the measurements. And this is very simple for, especially for left main. Uh, and it's way a very stable uh, situation. Um, so sometimes maybe your preference on your, on your resting index uh, is related to the kind of stenosis that you assess. It's very easy to disengage the, the guide, do the measurements and then go with a microcatheter over the stenosis and left main. And sometimes it's challenging if you're using FFR or, or, or RFR, IFR or so. Um, yeah, um, I think it's time to move on. Um, it's a great pleasure to see uh, Dr. Zenvin Lee again um, and uh, give this uh, talk on uh, post-PCI FFR, RFR. Uh, a topic we we heard quite a bit in the in the in the previous talk. So, uh, what is what is your take on it? Please uh, proceed. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Christoph, for the very kind words of introduction. Um, good day, everybody. As always, it's a pleasure to connect. Um, looking at the chat box and all the previous comments, I think this topic is uh, certainly a contentious one, and I look forward to having some discussions. Um, hopefully, not very heated at the end of this uh, presentation of mine. So I've been tasked for the next um, eight minutes or so to present on this specific topic of post-PCI, FFR and RFR. I think we've heard from different operators that everybody's um, personal practice is somewhat different. I hope to then illustrate my personal practice um, with some case presentations and without further ado, these are my disclosures. So before moving into the case presentations um, themselves, I think it's important for me to explain my setup. Um, for every case, I routinely uh, measure both the RFR as well as the FFR. The FFR will be done using intracoronary adenosine. And should there be any form of ambiguity or discordance, I will always rely on the FFR. Uh, that's simply because um, it has been around um, as gold standard for many years. Um, and should there be no discordance and both um, sets of values are actually um, similarly abnormal, I would then switch to the RFR pullback to determine the um, area that I should intervene. And we know that we've now got data that in terms of pullback, the performance of the RFR is actually equivalent to the IFR. Um, subsequently, post-procedure, um, I would then reassess physiology and by and large, all procedures would be done under the guidance of intracoronary imaging. So I started with the first case, which I've labeled to be ideal because these are some of the cases that we all would love to have um, with regard to post-PCI physiology. Um, as you can see on screen, um, this patient actually had relatively mild disease in the left circumflex and left main was actually healthy, um, but he had um, a borderline lesion in the proximal um, LAD, um, as you can see on screen, um, and he had a more severe disease in the proximal RCA, and this was then first fixed uh, with the guidance of an OCT. And the um, proximal RCA was then stented with a drug eluting stent, and this was the uh, final result for the RCA. So back to the borderline stenosis in the LAD, um, he first underwent a physiological assessment. As you can see, both sets of readings were in fact abnormal, and the pullback was done um, using the RFR, and clearly the step up was greatest um, over the proximal LED. Um, on OCT, this was a fairly focal lesion, um, fibrofatty um, in nature without much of calcium, a relatively short length stand, uh, stand was needed. And post-PCI, um, FFR was 0.9. And I believe this would be the ideal case that everybody would like to have. But in reality, this is not often the case, um, as you would see from this second case, which I've termed uh, as less ideal, but that's again, um, debatable. So the second patient had tandem lesions in the LAD, as you can see in the proximal as well as mid LAD. Um, at the same time, he had lesions in ostium of both the first and second diagonal as well, which were relatively large vessels. Um, circumflex also had what appeared to be an angiographically um, significant stenosis. And this gentleman also um, had a stenosis, which was borderline at the uh, posterior lateral artery, um, which would clearly be um, not functionally significant. But anyhow, um, this patient underwent multivessel um, physiological assessment. As you can see, this lesion in the posterior lateral artery was not significant. 
Um, likewise, the lesion in the circumflex was not significant based on the FFR, although clearly um, there was some discordance present over here. Um, the lesions in the ostium of the first as well as the second diagonal were not significant. Um, and just keep in mind that the value of this ostium um, lesion of the second diagonal was uh, 0.9 based on the FFR. And the LED, of course, um, yielded abnormal results, which were um, just like the first case, concordant in terms of the abnormalities. So given that this was a tandem lesion, of course, uh, the role of a pullback was very important, um, but the biggest step up was present over here. And there was a um, eccentric calcification over this lesion. The only issue with this particular lesion was that um, the healthy landing zone was actually further downstream. So the stent had to be extended until this particular region. Um, and post PCI, um, the FFR improved to 0 0.4, uh, 0.84, and the RFR improved to 0.89. So despite this being a less than ideal post PCI FFR, you know, except at this value, um, given the knowledge that there was actually further disease downstream, I was quite happy with the result that I achieved. But at this particular moment in time, the patient complained of having chest discomfort. And if you take a closer look, you're able to notice that the ostium of the second diagonal appeared to be more stenose compared to what it was before. Um, and FFR, which was initially um, 0.90, um, now was 0.58. And he underwent bailout KBT, which improved the um, FFR to 0.91. So I think in this particular case, it also highlights the importance of the utility of post-PCI FFR for site branches. Many a times, um, a lot of these site branches are quite forgiving, but not in this particular case, whereby its size was actually uh, fairly large. So I think the role would also extend to site branches, and this is why um, I feel that post-PCI FFR is actually important. I move on to the third case, which uh, was also less ideal, um, but this is again debatable. Just like the first patient, this patient had tandem lesions in the proximal as well as mid-LED. Um, and I thought that the mid-LED lesion appeared to be somewhat borderline. Um, and likewise, he also had tandem lesions in the left circumflex artery. And this was, um, in fact, a rather small vessel um, to begin with. Um, and there was relatively mild disease um, in the RCA. So just like the uh, preceding patients, he underwent a multivessel physiological assessment. As you can see, um, there was a uh, concordance in terms of the normality um, with regard to the circumflex. And I believe the fact that um, this sort of stenosis did not really manifest in an abnormal functional assessment would be the case of uh, being just a very small vessel and the area of subtended myocardium being actually rather small. So the FFR of the LED was clearly abnormal at 0.47. A pullback would reveal that the biggest step up was in fact for this particular lesion in the proximal LED. And on OCT, you're able to note that this was again a fibro fatty uh, area with uh, some degree of calcification. And this OCT was of course done after predilatation uh, to accommodate the OCT catheter. And after stenting the proximal segment, um, I thought um, sincerely at that point in time that the FFR would be normal, but the FFR turned out to be 0.73. I think this is important to understand um, the concept because at times after stenting um, the first lesion in the serial um, lesion setting, uh, the increment in coronary flow would tend to unmask the severity of the second lesion. So a repeat RFR pullback was then performed, and you can clearly note that there was also a step up for this particular area. Um, so this stenting uh, was in fact extended with the second stent, uh, overlapped with the first stent, and the um, FFR actually improved to 0.8. Once again, I accepted this and knowing that this is less than ideal with the knowledge that the diffuse disease in the distal part of the LED would probably have contributed to the less than ideal FFR, um, and the case was completed. So I'll now move to my last and final case of the day, which I've labeled it as non-ideal. Um, there is a question about because um, I think this is again debatable whether it is ideal or not. So this patient um, had relatively normal um, RF, uh, RCA, with the exception of some mild disease, um, proximally as well as um, at the distal RCA. And you can see that this patient had diffuse disease in the LAD, and it was really quite a small vessel um, angiographically. There was also a borderline lesion in the ostium of the first diagonal. Um, and likewise, he also had um, tandem lesions present in the left circumflex, uh, which turned out to be, once again, not functionally significant. Um, still, there was a discordance here, but I went with the level, or rather the reading of the FFR. Um, and 
with regard to the LED, you can clearly see that um, the result was clearly abnormal for both the FFR as well as the RFR. With regard to the diagonal um, ostium, well, the FFR um, was uh, normal or rather borderline, so I accepted this um, as okay, and I went forward with a pullback. So as you can see, there was a huge step up over here um, at the distal portion of the LED um, with relatively uh, mild step up um, all the way from the mid LED towards the proximal LED. And from the OCT, you're able to appreciate that this vessel size was in fact very, very small. Um, so the original plan was to actually go with the drug-coated balloon. Unfortunately, after balloon angioplasty, there was a huge degree of recall, um, and I scraped the idea of a DCB um, because I was not very confident of having a um, luminal gain that was sustained after the procedure. I had to go with um, drug eluting stents, which were honestly of a smaller diameter, and this was um, after the procedure itself. So um, the RFR actually improved 2.91, but try as I may, um, the FFR, the best FFR that I was able to achieve was 0.77. Um, but at the same time, the patient also um, almost immediately had symptomatic relief on table. Um, I repeated the OCT again. Um, there was really nothing much that I could do. Um, there wasn't any form of failure and the stand was well expanded. It wasn't any degree of the section or malaposition. Um, and in understanding the fact that sometimes this sort of a picture would oftentimes be seen in patients with diffuse disease, especially in the LAD, um, I accepted the results uh, for, what it worth, for what it's worth at that point in time. So um, I believe in summary, I just wish to provide a comment that all four patients, despite um, having different degrees of post-PCI physiological assessments, um, they are all very well at six months. Um, I've chosen all four patients uh, who have rather similar profiles. Um, and I believe that the post-PCI uh, value um, pertaining to physiological assessment, in my humble opinion, should be something that is routinely measured. Um, I think it is very important to, of course, understand the fact that there are multiple reasons as to why post-PCI FFR would be abnormal. And some of these reasons are ones that you see on screen. And then my diffuse distal disease, um, which is more commonly encountered in the LED, um, would oftentimes not uh, be able to be further optimized, um, but I believe that some of the other potential reasons as to why uh, the post-PCI FFR is actually low um, should be recognized, and this, I believe, is very important. Um, all of us would have our own algorithm, and I think that this is something that is also very important. Um, if at any point in time um, there is a um, post uh, or other suboptimal FFR post-procedure, it is very important to then go back to imaging if it hasn't been done to begin with. And I cannot um, stress um, the importance of uh, functional optimization with the usage of intracoronary imaging. And I think uh, this is something that we have all been advocated. Uh, we have all been advocating for a long time, um, hence the name of this particular club, uh, TCIP. So um, with that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your kind attention. I look forward to um, discuss around this particular topic. Thank you, Dr. Lee, um, for giving so many points and uh, thoughts, uh, provoking ideas. Um, you covered quite a lot on post-PCI stenting, um, even side branch, um, where I was really confused and, and uh, are surprised that the side branch was, uh, was important uh, there, or the nose was important there. Um, maybe um, we can uh, have the opinion of uh, Dr. Xu uh, on post-PCI um, uh, FFR or RFR, and especially if we are so such a big group with so from so many countries, uh, what is the av availability of, 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 of a different test in, in your country, Dr. Zhu? Yeah, I, I think that's a lot of, uh, uh, such as CTFFR, QFFR, CFFR, a lot of uh, such kind of, uh, uh, physiology uh, uh, examinations. Uh, but for the Dr. Lee's case, uh, I think uh, uh, the, last, uh, the last one, uh, I have some different opinions. Uh, yes, uh, we wish to recheck to do FFR. I believe the uh, FFR data uh, um, because uh, uh, 
um, how to say, uh, we know it can, uh, the vessel cause ischemia or not is uh, important. Uh, another thing is also important. Uh, could we use PCI to, to release the ischemia? It's another question. So we should balance the two uh, things. Uh, if the uh, ischemia is very, uh, very serious and the PCI is also very easy, it's, a no, it's a no problem. But if the PCI is very complex or the PCI can cause very, uh, can give us very uh, little uh, benefit uh, and the ischemia is also not so serious, that's a question. Should we do PCI? And should we uh, cut, uh, give the patient, uh, do good to the patient? Uh, so for a long time, uh, do you follow up? So that's a, that's a question. So for the, uh, uh, the second case, the third case, I think uh, we should use a, a big stand to stand a local lesion. We should do that PCI. But for the last one, it's a very diffuse lesion. Uh, the, Long-term follow-up uh, for the resonances rate uh, is really well high, and uh, uh, the ischemia is not so uh, so. I think it's a seven point. I, I should not do PCI. I just uh, use the medicine treatment for such kind of patient. That's my opinion. So uh, for different uh, uh, text, uh, we should uh, understand it. Uh, uh, um, uh, more how to see, more we should know the backup of the thing, not just the data. That's my opinion. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Zhu. I, I think that's that's very important points that you raised, uh, especially uh, in diffuse disease. That um, in PCI. <clears throat> or PCI is, is, is not the best thing uh, always um, uh, to go forward in, in diffuse disease. And it's not, um, if you rely too, too much on these numbers, uh, you get tempted um, to, to implant. But sometimes um, you, you do a lot of PCI and diffuse disease with a long stent, uh, stent uh, way, and then uh, the patient gets better. So it's, it's hard to tell, but uh, thanks for, for your insights there. I think we have to move on uh, to our next case. And I, I would uh, like to invite uh, Dr. Paul Ong from Singapore to take over. Hi, Christoph. Thanks very much. And, uh, you know, we, we've been, you know, having a really good uh, uh, morning so far and you know, really good discussions. So, so things get, you know, even more interesting now because we have um, Adrian, Dr., uh, Professor Adrian Lowe from Singapore to give us a lecture talking about the limitations of FFR, IFR, or even RFR. And are we really ready for the CFR, IMR, or QFR, et cetera? So without further ado, over to you, Adrian. Thank you very much, uh, Paul. Let me just uh, try and start this. Okay, uh, I've got a lot to talk about then. I'm not sure if I can uh, cover everything. So I'm just gonna jump right in. Let's see if I could get my cursor to... Okay, so the patient that I have to share today is actually a 73-year-old woman who actually presented recently to us with some big uh, pre syncopal symptoms, but because of dynamic ECG changes and troponin elevation to 3,000, uh, she subsequently had a current angiogram some four days after admission to validate for coronary artery disease. And this is her right coronary artery disease uh, that you can see, uh, high-grade mid-RCA stenosis, and the left system was essentially normal. So what we did was actually to have a, an evaluation of her right coronary artery because her symptoms were not really typical of angina. And you can see that the RFR is uh, clearly normal. And we did uh, the full physiological evaluation of the right coronary artery stenosis. And you see that among all the indices, that the only one that stands out as abnormal was FFR. And now in my center, we don't have actually a QRFR, but we have something equivalent from Siemens, which is a proprietary uh, algorithm that, that try to calculate uh, an FFR 
from angiography images, and they calculated the QFI equivalent was 0.82. So we also did a pullback analysis just to confirm that this was a focal lesion that is sustainable, and indeed it was, and the patient underwent uh, uneventful coronary stenting of the right coronary artery. Post-PCI functional evaluation was performed, and I will just uh, show you the, the pullback here with a minimal residual gradient, and the post-PCI QFI equivalent was 0.91. Now, this is a summary of the indices that uh, were performed, and if we might just want to focus on the pre-intervention indices, you see that Clearly, the only index that was uh, clearly abnormal was FFI, and that led to the intervention. And it was actually quite surprising that the non hyperemic pressure ratios were very normal, and the QFR was, was the only one that was closest uh, to the FFR. And we also to routinely measure some other parameters, and some of which I will uh, deal with a little later soon. So I think we have had a whole morning to discussing about the discordance of the resting indices or non hyperemic pressure ratios of FFR. And the general agreement is that in about one in five cases, you're going to have uh, discordance and has already been dealt with by Dr. An and Dr. Mottenken. There are some situations where this might happen in particular, patients who have uh, proximal to, uh, lesions, um, uh, female gender, as well as uh, coronary anatomy, to, uh, such as a diffuse disease could all actually result in discordance of FFR as well as the non hyperemic pressure ratios. Now this is particularly uh, evident in diffuse disease where you would expect that the FFR would generally turn towards uh, negative and IFR being positive, as was already discussed earlier. Now, do this all have an impact? Well, I think the data is just gathering and waiting for formal uh, publication of Dr. An's data from the IRIS registry. But what we do know so far is that from the limited data that we see, the group that fares worse is if they have concordant abnormal RFR and FFR. At least at the current status, the available data suggests that in patients with discordant uh, RFR and FFR, they do seem to have comparable outcomes, but bear in mind that this is very limited data set. Now, one other important point that I would like to highlight on the reason why there is this uh, discordance between the resting ratios as well as FFR is this relationship to hyperemia. Basically, all the index that we are measuring is essentially a fraction of the distal pressure to the central aortic pressure. And the presence of hyperemia, it will result in a reduction of this ratio. So where there is maximal hyperemia, we will have a ratio that is equivalent to what is called a true FFR. And in the absence of hyperemia, you have a true rest index. The problem I think that we encounter is that it's difficult to know whether the patient has a truly resting state when you are actually measuring a rest index. And the classic uh, index in between this rest index and the true FFR would surely be the contrast FFR, where we know that the administration of contrast can produce some form of hyperemia. So, in summary, I would say that the effect of hyperemia can have an impact on your interpretation of the rest index. We know that any form of hyperemia will result in a change of the hyperemia, uh, sorry, your NHPRs to a lower value, and therefore it may result in an overestimation of the hemodynamic significance. So things like the administration of uh, flushes, GTN, contrast we know can cause it can result in this sort of discordance. And conversely, for a hyperemic index, you need really to be certain that you have adequate hyperemia. And as was discussed earlier, sometimes you can have issues of ensuring adequate hyperemia, and this might actually result in suboptimal uh, FFR. And I think uh, uh, Dr. Kern actually highlighted the importance of technical issues such as this here.
So I think that's a nice segue to the second part of this section, which is on some of these new uh, parameters that uh, look into the microcirculation. So what is the current microcirculation? I think the focus so far has been on the macrocirculation dealing with flow. We've talked about FFR, the non-hyperemic uh, pressure ratios. And in essence, the plumbing job, the things that uh, will want us to want to do a standing. Now, we can see from this pictorial representation that the hard circulation is more than the macro circulation. In fact, uh, the big part of it is the micro circulation. And this is actually what determines the hyperemic response and for which the newer indices such as RMR, HMR, and also a, an O index, CFR, uh, is actually derived from. So you require hyperemia in order to have an evaluation or determination of this indices. So what can we say? We, I think we can assume that a normal coronary flow as ascertained by an FFR and worse on just angiography alone cannot uh, be used to imply that a patient has normal coronary vasculation. And I think we've reached a stage where we need to consider these other additional indices to better understand the patient's situation. So let's just jump right into coronary flow reserve. It really is the oldest uh, hemodynamic index that we are discussing now. And in essence, it is the ratio of the maximum coronary flow to the rest coronary flow. It basically tells us how much flow can improve or increase in the presence of a stressful state. So this uh, pictorial uh, diagram here illustrates the whole concept of coronary flow reserve. In a normal situation, because of autoregulation, there is microvascular tone. And where there is an increased demand, there is arterial dilatation. And this results in an increase in coronary flow that we can measure. In the situation where there is epicardial coronary stenosis, in order to maintain adequate flow in the basal state, there is already partial microvascular dilatation. Hence, the microvascular dilatation that can occur with stress is significantly reduced, and you will therefore see a lower CFR in contrast to someone who has normal vasculature. Now, although coronary flow reserve has already been uh, proposed and discussed even way before FFR. The reason why it has not actually caught on is because it is so dependent on resting flow. We've seen this graph earlier by Dr. An, and we know that the even the normal physiological status like the heart rate, the preload, anxiety state of the patient can have significant impact on the CFR because of these challenges uh, that we see and in consistency in getting a coronary flow reserve, it has not actually caught on. The other issue, of course, is that the original coronary flow reserve was actually derived from using a Doppler wire, which is not easy to manipulate, a lot more expensive. Now, with the introduction of a thermal dilution technique to estimate the coronary flow reserve, I, there has been a recent uh, increase in deriving the CFR also. Now, I would say that in general, practice, you can equate the thermal dilution derived CFR to the Doppler derived CFR, which is uh, considered the gold standard. There are, of course, caveats to that. Now, we've talked about the re main reason why the CFR has not caught on, mainly because of the dependency on the true baseline flow. It is less reproducible. And also, we're not quite clear what is a normal to CFR. If you look at the standard textbooks, you're going to see it ranging from 2.0 to 2.5. And some people even consider a CFR 1.8 to be normal. The other issue is that CFR considers also the impact of epicardial disease. And if we really want something that focuses on the microcirculation, you're going to have to look at another index. Now, before I, I switch gears, the one other aspect I'd like to highlight is that a CFR can arise in two ways. One is what is generally regarded as functional microvascular dysfunction, where you have actually elevated resting flow and the hyperemic flow, although normal, because it's less than what you would anticipate from the elevated resting flow result in a low CFR. 
In a structural microvascular dysfunction, you will also have a low CFR. But in this case, it is due to a low hyperemic flow. So to address the issue of uh, microcirculatory dysfunction specifically, the Stanford group came up with the idea of an index of microcirculatory resistance, IMR. So they proposed that this index actually correlates very well with true microcirculatory resistance. And one of the advantages and reasons for its interest is that it is a lot more reproducible in contrast to CFR. And we also know what is the normal RMR value based on current available literature, which is less than 25. Of course, like any physiological index, there are certain caveats that we keep in mind. And where there is significant epicardial stenosis, you may have to apply a correction factor to get a correct uh, IMR measurement. By and large, the derivation of IMR is actually pretty straightforward. As long as you do your FFR measurements and you can do your your thermal dilution uh, uh, technique, you should be able to uh, obtain your IMR using the appropriate software such as Coral Ventus. So let's recap now briefly. We talked about uh, FFR a lot, which focuses on flow. CFR considers both the macro and micro circulation. And now we have an index IMR that is exclusively focusing on the micro circulation. Are there practical implications to learning how to use IMR? I'll say that there are four main areas, but I think in this part of the world, I'll focus only on three because I think very few of us are actually involved in heart transplantation. As the admission MIC is where there is most data on the use of IMR. And over the last uh, 20, uh, close to 20 years now, since the introduction of IMR, there is a slew of studies correlating IMR to various non-invasive uh, parameters as well as outcomes. And it's now widely accepted to be a good outcome measure following SD Evasion MI. We know that an IMR value of greater than 40 correlates very well with death and, and heart failure hospitalizations. In fact, uh, this uh, value of IMR for prognostication is now widely accepted and it's now serving as the basis for future directions, such as guiding further treatment, step-down care, as well as potential adjunctive therapy. Now, one other area that has uh, grown in interest in recent years surely must be ischemia and non-obstructive uh, coronary artery disease, or ENOCA. And the COMICA trial uh, conducted in Western Scotland actually supports the use of this uh, functional evaluation of uh, patients with chest pain, but non-obstructive coronary artery disease. This was a blinded randomized controlled trial involving about just 150 patients, largely female, median age 61 years. And the point was to evaluate the patient's uh, quality of life and angina response to a specific treatment. So they were basically classified into four endotypes, microvascular angina, vasospastic angina, mixed picture or neither based on the protocol as you can see above. And with the specific endotype, treatment can therefore be tailored. And what is uh, important is that they've shown that this does result in an improvement in quality of life that is sustained up to a year. So I think this is a, an important study that supports the use of functional evaluation in a cath lab for patients who have non-obstructive coronary artery disease. Now in the setting of stable coronary artery disease, there has been also some data that supports its use. IMR, we know, predicts MI related to PCI in this relatively old and small study done quite a few years back by Martin Ng. We also know that just like uh, FFR post-PCI can predict uh, outcome, IMR post-PCI, it has also a predictive value. A high MR is associated with worse outcomes compared to a patient with a low IMR following successful intervention. Now, this whole uh, issues of this additional indices was also recently evaluated, especially by the Korean group, where they evaluated the value of looking at the CFR and IMR 
in patients with intermediate coronary artery stenosis. So they basically stratified patients. Uh, specifically, if you look at the group that has what is considered a normal FFI, you can see that they do compose of a diverse group of patients that have both normal and abnormal IMR. And if you stratify the group with uh, a normal FFR into those that have both an abnormal CFI and IMR, you see that they do portend a worse off prognosis. So these parameters actually provide additional value beyond the FFR uh, measurement after PCI. Now I'm going to jump back into your flow index and specifically the QFR or quantitative flow ratio. It is actually one of several uh, parameters. A lot of them are proprietary that serves to compute an FFR based on standard invasive and geography images. One of the seminal studies was a Wi-Fi 2 study that actually to, in the initial to study suggests a very good uh, correlation with your standard invasive FFR. And more recently, we have the Favor Tree a China study that shows the advantage of a KFR guided group in contrast to an angiography guided group. Now, what was impressive is that there was significant reduction in all cause mortality MI in ischemia driven revascularization. So, what does this mean? Does this mean that uh, we should all adopt QFR? I think uh, there is still a need for additional data. And this uh, viewpoint article uh, that I'll direct you to actually uh, provides a very nice summary on the current status of this QFR and related uh, indices. Now, one of the advantages of QFR over the CTFFR that was initially proposed is that you actually can get a rather fast uh, interpretation yeah, in contrast to FFR CT, when you require previously overnight analysis by supercomputer, and then that was subsequently down to a few hours. But this actually used a, a much simpler to Bernoulli to, uh, calculations in contrast to computational fluid dynamics. But when you oversimplify things, you can run into issues. And there are concerns with things such as zero lesions and diffuse disease. They also have assumptions of minimal microvascular resistance with maximal blood flow. And as we know in clinical practice, even with an invasive measure, it can sometimes be challenging to measure the microvascular resistance or ensuring that it is uh, low. And what is more important, I think, is that in the range of FFR, or what we call the intermediate FFR between 0.70 to 0.80, it is where it does not correlate very well. And in a meta-analysis, they find that it can vary as much as up to 1.4, especially when in that uh, FFR range. So is this something that is acceptable? Well, what is my take? Well, my take is that it is certainly better than coronary luminography. QFR is or maybe equivalent to FFR in the correct context. And certainly I think uh, in this current era, we really shouldn't be making decisions for revascularization based on coronary geography alone. So what technical messages do I have? Just a couple. The first is that I believe that the measures of epicardial significance are not equivalent. And the speakers prior have already emphasized that RFR is not equivalent to FFR. It might provide uh, similar information, but there are times when you're going to have uh, discordant information and you really have to, to ask yourself why that might be so. QFR is an emerging uh, modality that might actually be equivalent to FFR in the right situation. But again, there are issues that I've highlighted. And in particular, having uh, good and geography images because it's all based on uh, good uh, computation from your geography images. Now, we've also alluded to the new microcirculation indices. Now, these microcirculation indices do provide incremental information and can be particularly helpful in patients with challenging conditions, such as ischemia and non-obstructive coronary artery disease, or where 
you want to have a better idea on the prognostic impact following successful primary angioplasty or the evaluation of new treatment modalities. Now, what is also uh, should be emphasized is that hyperemia is necessary for calculation of this uh, new indices of microcirculation. And personally, if I'm going to be using hyperemia, I would be relying a lot more on FFR because I see that it gives me a lot more consistent results. And I think that the data for it is stronger. And there are people who feel that, do we really need to have to do all these indices? Well, I'll say that it depends. And I think if you have the facility and the interest it actually does make uh, your current uh, intervention work a lot more interesting. And I think it also uh, provides a lot more satisfaction seeing how it changes following successful intervention. And certainly these new indices may provide uh, additional value for your patients. That's all I have. And I hope I managed to answer some of the questions. Adrian, this is fantastic. So you know, while you're giving this lecture, I think the uh, chat group among the uh, faculties kind of lit up. And uh, the, the, the phrase that I saw is uh, you provided the, the, the A to Z in coronary physiology within one lecture. Um, so, you know, really congratulations, fantastic talk. And we all learned so much from that. Um, can I now invite uh, Chiang? Uh, to just give us a few comments, uh, you know, following this is really good, you know, to the force of coronary physiology. Chiang? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Paul. Um, I honestly don't know, don't know where to start. Um, I think that was a great, great lecture um, by Adrian. Um, I, I think maybe the message to, uh, to the junior fellows is um, it, it, Adrian really provided a lot of uh, information about some of the other types of uh, uh, not so commonly performed um, uh, uh, physiology indices that we can do these days. Um, but perhaps the message is to, you know, maybe just stay focused on the FFR and IFR um, first to get really familiar with that, understand the, uh, uh, the thinking behind, behind that, the basic kind of, uh, or, or more um, basic or more uh, conventional kind of physiology assessments. Once you're really good with that, then, um, and if you have the facility, like uh, Adrian said, uh, you can uh, start dabbling a little bit with the, the, the more advanced um, kind of uh, uh, physiology assessments. Um, I do agree with a lot of Adrian's points. Do we need so many uh, indices? Um, the more the merrier, or, or, or do we get more and more confused? Um, I, I, you know, struggle between getting confused and understanding, confused and understanding. Um, so I, I think uh, it's, it's always good to have more information, more, more, more um, facilities at hand. Um, but uh, each, each um, index has to be treated with um, care, I guess, and, and caution. And we really have to understand what question you want um, answered when we choose a, a particular um, index to perform. Um, like Adrian and, and Sydney and a few others on this panel, I, I do I dabble a little bit in uh, microvascular um, uh, research as well. And my issue with the CFR and IMR at the moment is still the, the reproducibility and the variability of it. Um, just like how we do cardiac output by the thermodilution mm -hmm. method, you, you take 10 different measurements, you get um, 10 different numbers sometimes, and, uh, and, and sometimes you end up choosing the numbers yourself, to, you know, the ones that kind of best fit what you think it is. Um, so it's, it, there's still a little bit... Um, I, I don't know how much can be done um, from a technology point of view, but, uh, but hopefully um, the wire can be uh, uh, um, uh, improved or the processes can be improved to such a way that uh, we can reduce some of this reproducibility. Um, but otherwise, I think that was a fantastic uh, uh, lecture by Adrian, and hopefully, uh, uh, I, I'm sure uh, we'll see more of these uh, microvascular uh, assessments uh, come into uh, practice in future. Thank you very much, Yang. I think, you know, um, the organizer all here in, uh, to this and maybe, you know, topic to discuss uh, in future uh, webinar uh, on the microvascular uh, uh, side of coronary physiology. Now, I know we're really uh, running behind, uh, but, you know, make no apologies because we have such fantastic group of speakers. So I've, we're saving the best till last. Um, so we're going to have a little bit of forward looking uh, lecture on coronary physiology. So beyond the FFR and IFR, here we're going to invite uh, Eric from Hong Kong to give us the last lecture. Over to you, Eric. Thank you, um, Dr. Paul Ang, for the kind introduction. Can you see my screen? Yeah, we can see your screen, okay. So we would like, I would like to thank Dr. Jack Tang and the Dr. Lam Ho for the kind invitation. Today, I'm going to talk about something a little bit um, different from what mentioned about. Um, so my topic will be beyond FFR and IFR. 
So thank you, Professor Lowe, for the kind introduction on ischemia without obstructive coronary artery and the index of microcircular resistance. It remains undiagnosed and undertreated, not only in Asia, but in all parts of the world. And I would like to talk about how we can perform invasive assessment of the coronary microvascular and endothelial function so that we can be guided in terms of our target of treatment of these patients. Let me go through patient number one. He's a 59-year-old patient with history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, shortness of breath on exertion, and angina. However, a coronary angiogram showed only a mid-LED myocardial breaching and a mild proximal right coronary artery lesion. He was put on beta blocker, statin, and serotonin or epinephrine uptake uh, inhibitor and Lyrica. Probably he was labeled to have some anxiety disorder and maybe depression because his coronary angiogram really cannot account for his symptoms. However, he did have a coronary CTA, which documented a 35 millimeter myocardial bridge with encasement of the coronary by overlying muscle. It was not super, I mean, the, num the thickness of the muscle was not over one centimeter, but there were some septal branches between the bridge. So we brought the patient to the cath lab. Again, the right coronary artery was kind of normal. It was kind of a co-dominant circulation. And on the left side, you could see uh, mild moderate disease near the high diagonal branch, but otherwise no obstructive coronary artery lesion in the major epicardial coronaries. You can see on cranial view, again, you might appreciate some mild cardio breaching in the mid LED segment, but I don't think anyone would perform any stenting or surgical procedure on that based on this angiography. However, because of his persistent symptoms of angina and shortness of breath, we did perform endothelial function testing by injecting acetylcholine. A1 means we injected 20 microgram followed by 50 microgram. You can already appreciate over 80% reduction in diameter in the lumen after injection of acetylcholine. And it was particularly severe in the breached segment but again, is everywhere. And the patient did have EKG change as well as chest pain during the angiography. And finally, we reversed the effect of acetylcholine with intracoronary nitroglycerin. And you can appreciate the myocardial breach and the milking here. So the this patient does have endothelial dysfunction and coronary artery spasm. It's also known as vasospastic angina, Prince Matto angina named after Dr. Prince Matto. Is also named as barren angina because it's not typical angina. And it may also be named as angina inversa compared with angina pectoris. So acetyl there are many methods to trigger these kind of spasms. So acetylcholine or your ergotamine, which is an um, inhibitor or trigger of the serotonin-related reaction, but acetylcholine is a trigger of endothelium-dependent vascular reaction. In healthy subjects, there will be nitric oxide release with acetylcholine and the end result would be coronary vasodilatation. However, in dysfunctional endothelium, such as in the presence of atherosclerosis or within the myocardial bridges, there will be blunted nitric oxide release. As you know, acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter, so there will be muscarinic stim stimulation of the smooth muscle, and the net effect will be epicardial and microvascular vasoconstriction. If you can, you can see the vasoconstriction of angiography, there is epicardial constriction. You cannot see any vasoconstriction on angiogram, but the patient does have EKG change and chest pain during the procedure. It's named microvascular vasoconstriction. Very often, it's a combination of both. And the treatment in that case will be calcium channel blocker and maybe nitrates, but actually we should avoid beta blockers in this case. However, the story does not end here. We could also see a myocardial breach in the mid LED. So that's why we need to perform objective assessment of the severity of the myocardial breach. Let me go to the IVIS in the area of interest. You could see systolic compression of the mid LED at that area uh, of the bridging with the aluminal stenosis, luminal compression of a 10%. You could also see this radio loosen ring is termed as a halo sign or a half moon sign, is actually the overlying skeletal muscle. So if you do have a call lab, you can assess the length of the myocardial bridge. You can assess how many branches, receptive branches, and diagonal branches are involved by the bridge. And then you can try to quantify the severity of the bridge, as well as to find out whether there's any proximal part burden. So there are several things that we look at. We check for the amount of arterial compression compared with diastole and systole. We check for the thickness of the halo. 
we check for the plug word and proximal data breach. So if you are a CTO operator, you will probably appreciate that a lot of the times prior to the, uh, after CTOs, uh, prior to the CTO, prior to the bridging segment, there's actually a CTO segment. And when you open up the channel and you perform the IFIS, you will find out there is a severe myocardial breaching this to the CTO segment. So proximal to a myocardial breach because of the abnormal shear stress, very often you can find there is a plug word in there. So you have to give these patients medical treatment despite the apparently normal, normal angiography. So statin antiplatelet agent for these patients. And then we can appreciate, quantify the amount of compression. However, this only gives information regarding the anatomical characteristics of this myocardial breach, but we don't know whether that is functionally significant or not. So we need to check the microvascular function as well. So Professor Lowe has already mentioned about how we perform CFR and IMR. We give IV adenosine to achieve maximal hyperemia. We perform FFR and calculate the IMR from thermal dilution method. Compared with normal or usual FFR, in the assessment of myocardial breaches, we have to use diastole FFR with dobutamine stress compared with normal a sclerotic CAD, where we use adenosine and the mean FFR value because that would give us a mean FFR value involving both systole and diastole. However, we understand that um, there might be confounding factors which I'll go into later in myocardial breaches. So that's why we have to use diastole FFR. We can also use atropine to induce uh, a tachycardia and on top of the dobutamine stress test. And then classically, a cutoff of 0.76 or below is considered hemodynamically significant. As I mentioned before, mean FFR is for evaluation of ischemia from fixed obstructive CAD because there was similar drop in the systolic and diastolic pressures across the stenosis. However, in myocardial breaching, the ischemia is dynamic and occurs in late systole to early diastole. Very often, there's a delay in luminal diameter recovery due to arterial compression from the myocardial bridges. So although coronary flow classically is during diastolic phase, however, because of this delay in luminal recovery, there is also ischemia, this, uh, not only at the systolic phase, but at the, actually during the diastolic phase. Dobutamine can promote chronotropic and inotropic effect and simulate the dynamic stenosis generated by the myocardial bridges. When the vessel is being compressed by the muscles, there is actually increase in systolic pressure distal to the bridge, and that may surpass the systolic aortic pressure. This so-called milking effect and the retrograde systolic flow will actually raise the mean FFR value. So for these patients, the mean FFR value may not change at all, but the bridge is hemodynamically significant. So in some way, this patient has severe endothelial dysfunction because if you look at the IMR is 38, and especially at the bridge, uh, and the field dysfunction because of the coronary spasm, especially the bridge segment, his IMR is actually normal at 70. So his core normal coronary microvascular function, but there is hemodynamic and bridging. So he underwent surgical unroofing of the bridging. And uh, so he, with a significant improvement in the symptoms and quality of life. So in order to perform coronary microvascular function, Professor Lowe has already talked about, we, give, uh, we perform FFR in the standard fashion, we put the FFR Y in the distal LED, and we inject, a dentist, we inject um, saline to a three-way uh, three cc syringe to perform thermal dilution. And then we give IV adenosine according to the protocol and we, we calculate uh, the IMR and maximal hyperemia. Professor Lowe has gone through this slide already. For CFR, we are looking at the entire vasculature including the epicardial vessel as well as the microvasculature. The IMR is specific to the microvasculature where the FFR only gives us information regarding the epicardium. So I will skip this because Professor Lowe has already uh, given us detailed uh, lectures on that. But again, the IMR is a calculation of the microcircular resistance and it's less affected by changing hemodynamic conditions. So there are studies validating uh, whether we perform RV pacing, get dobutamine or get nitride, whether there will be any change in the IMR. Uh, actually, there will be changes in CFR, but with pacing or nitroperoxide or dobutamine, there is actually minimal change in IMR and FFR value. So it's very reproducible. For this patient number two, 
He's a 71 year old patient. He's an ex worker, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, abnormal stress test, chest pain, and we can see in the myocardial bridge. Again, we perform acetylcholine injection in order to assess for endothelial dysfunction. We could appreciate some corneal spasm. And also, we could appreciate the breach of the reduced nitri nitroglycerin. However, is this hemodynamic significant? We don't know. And that's why we performed the breathing stress test and uh, performed diastolic effort, of, which is actually 0.79, which is negative. However, his index of microcircular resistance is abnormal at 37. So an abnormal cutoff is over 25. So this patient has coronary endothelial dysfunction and microvascular dysfunction in the presence of a myocardial breach. He was treated with a statin, an ACE inhibitor, nitrates, and beta blocker. There are some beliefs that nitrates will worsen myocardial breaching, but actually it only makes the myocardial breaches more obvious on angiography, but will not worsen symptoms. Very often these patients have concomitant endothelial dysfunction and coronary spasm, so nitrates may actually relieve the symptoms. And beta blocker, such as nabithalo um, or cafetalo, some other uh, beta blockers with vasodilatory effect may actually be used with caution in the setting of coronary artery spasm. He does not need surgical unmute. Not only FFR, IFR has also been evaluated in the uh, study of myocardial breaching because not all centers can perform diastolic FFR with the coroventus system. And mean FFR, as I said, is not very useful in assessing myocardial breaches. However, as you know, IFR is a diastolic specific index it may not be hampered by systolic pressure gradient inversion by the myocardial bridges. Um, of course, it has not been validated in the dobutamine stress setting, so it's termed as hyperemic wave-free period pressure ratio, which WPR in this setting. The cutoff is not known. In this study by Terratini, um, there are patient, 20 patients with documented myocardial bridges on CT, coronary angiogram, and positive stress tests. We brought the patient to the CAT lab. As I said, the mean FFR did not change much. Actually, after dobutamine, it actually, the value raised it because you can see the yellow curve and systolic overshooting confounding the FFR value. However, the IFR value did drop after dobutamine stress and the IFR pullback confirmed uh, the gradient at the myocardial bridge. And for these 20 patients, again, when you give dobutamine, the FFR value did not change much. And if you give dobutamine and check IFR, this hyperemic wave free period ratio did drop from 0.88 to 0.79. So I have talked about two cases with ischemia with the obstructive coronary artery disease. First patient has a myocardial breach, which is hemodynamically significant. He has coronary artery spasm, especially at the breach segment, and normal microvascular function. Second patient does have a breach, but it's not hemodynamically significant. But he has microvascular dysfunction and endothelial dysfunction. So the take home message will be invasive assessment of coronary endothelial function, microvasculature, and myocardial bridges are useful in assessment of INOCA. So measuring IMR is specific, quantitative, and reproducible. IFR is an alternative to diastolic FFR in evaluating the hemodynamic significance of myocardial bridges. So I would like to thank Dr. Jack Tan for the kind invitation for the whole of course, and my previous two teachers at Stanford, Jennifer Tramo, William Fiorn, and Alan Yerm, of course. And hopefully we could see you again uh, this year in Hong Kong Valve in person. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. Um, you know, it, it, we thought, you know, it's the hard act to follow Asian, but, you know, we now have another brilliant uh, lectures and obviously talking about some of the really controvers uh, controversial management of this muscle bridging and you certainly provide us with some new uh, insights into how you you assess this group of patients um, perhaps i can bring william uh, into uh, the discussion uh, william would you be able to give us some comments uh, on you know uh, following eric's excellent talk yeah, this is a nice talk. No? I think you now when it comes to myocardial bridging, uh, the best assessment study is to put them in induced uh, diastolic FFR. Okay, if we do a conventional FFR, uh, it won't able to tell you uh, whether the myocardial bridging is causing the symptom or not. 
The problem with the conventional FFR is that uh, it's based on mean pressure assessment. And when there's a maximum it can actually evaluate the mean pressure. So it gives us a false negative FFR reading. So that's why when it comes to market pitching, always do the diagnostic FFR. And we've under the dopamine uh, infusion would be the best assessment technique. And then the other thing I want to mention is that just now Eric for the first case, he did IFAS. Actually on IFAS, there's an index called the uh, malcatic pitching muscle index that is mm. based on the halo thickness and the malcatic pitching length. So if you uh, times together, if the uh, result is more than 5.05. .05. The correlation with diagnostic FFR uh, 0.76 is very good. Uh, mm -hmm. With the, I think, uh, with the sensitivity as uh, 86% and the specificity 88.9%. Uh, so if the porter is more than 0.202, then all the bulk pitching, when you do the diagnostic FFR, will be less than 0.76. So if we don't do like uh, download FFR, we can do IFS. And then using this uh, Malkati Pitching uh, Muscle Index, MMI. Yes, yeah, this is also well validated. Yes. And I, I'm just curious from all the speakers, you know, um, how, how easy is it to convince your surgeons to do the, the roofing of bridging? Uh, I, I'm, when, you, when you bombard them with all these data, um, does it actually make any difference uh, when you come to convince them to do surgery? Silence. I think, um, I think it's not uncommon for uh, us to not only encounter patients with ENOCA, but also MI without obstructive coronal artery. And the only thing that we see is actually a, as a quite significant myocardial breach. So if the patient does have recurrent symptoms despite medical therapy, I think uh, surgical and roofing might be indicated. It's probably indicated after objective assessment of the hemodynamic significance of these reasons. But of course, in the assessment of Minoka, um, a holistic assessment would be MRI heart and also OCT of the vessels for other possibilities like SCAD, et cetera, or ruptured plant. Very good point, Eric. Thank you. Um, Maybe I, I will bring Adrian back in because uh, Adrian, you actually you know, um, showed us a, a whole range of investigation techniques. So maybe back on the muscle bridging side, what's your practice uh, when you encounter them? How do you assess these patients uh, further? Yeah, I think uh, that's a, a good question. I don't think I can do better than what uh, Eric uh, has uh, so uh, detailed uh, we discussed. So I don't have anything else to add to Eric's assessment. Yeah, but like you say, uh, convincing the patient and the patient uh, to go for a de-roofing surgery is, is actually going to be challenging. And a lot of times, honestly, um, I will just uh, try and optimize medical therapy as much as possible, maybe increasing the beta blockers if uh, the patient can tolerate it. Great. So um, I think in, you know, if there's no other questions, then I will probably hand it now back to uh, Christoph uh, to do the closing. Uh, can I trouble you, uh, Christoph? Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, um, for handing me over. Um, it's my great pleasure and honor to, to do the sum up of the second um, fellows course of the Transcontinental Imaging and Physiology Club. Uh, this time we focus on physiology and I think we had fantastic talks uh, starting with the basics of uh, coronary uh, physiology assessment uh, from Dr. Ahn and he even gave us some, some peeks into the in unpublished data. Uh, I think his key point was FFR uh, to, to stick to FFR uh, uh, as a gold standard if, uh, whenever it's possible. And then uh, we came to the IFR um, and the co-registration and uh, the pullback from Dr. Song. Uh, and he showed us the nice uh, cases and the importance of these two measurements in IFR to assess the patient. Uh, it was a great pleasure uh, for us uh, to have uh, the grandmother of uh, uh, physiology, uh, Professor Martin Kern, uh, to give his talk and he gave us five things to, to worry about and to think about the conundrums of uh, physiology, uh, the discordance 
uh, uh, of sev several testing and uh, serial testing and serial lesions. Um, I think his key point on ACS was not to do FFR in infarct related artery. Uh, and uh, for me, um, as a as a more clinician than a, a research uh, physiologist, is uh, um, do one test and uh, or do none, uh, not to be too confused by too many indices. Um, and uh, Dr. Lee showed us nice cases, a couple of cases of post-PCI, uh, RFR and FFR with side branch and uh, even controversial case uh, with a, with a um, uh, diffuse disease uh, with lots of discussion. And then um, Professor H. Lo uh, opened up the door to a whole new concept of uh, the microcirculation. Uh, I think that's that's something that uh, we will hear about in the next couple of years, even more, um, to the coronary flow and uh, the IMR. And then uh, we had some nice examples, clinical examples uh, from Dr. Chen on uh, coronary uh, physiology, um, how to use it uh, beyond the, the typical IFR or FFR um, test, and even how to tackle the conundrum of uh, INOCA. Um, and last, I would like to thank uh, the APSC for the, um, for the support, Dr. Zheng, Jack Ten, uh, my co-moderators, Dr. Uh, Sydney Lowe from Australia and uh, Dr. Polong from Singapore uh, for this um, fantastic hosting and uh, the fantastic um, panelists for this vibrant, um, discussion, and especially Dr. Lam Ho for uh, being the driving force behind these uh, webinars. Um, I wish you all a nice weekend, great holidays, and see you next time soon, hopefully. And Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Merry Christmas. Bye-bye.